Welcome to Dallas Online. I'm Saleh Yassin, taking you in a history subject with the topic today, changes in political, social, and economic policies in Africa after independence. A few days ago, we began uh, analyzing this topic. So today, we shall make a continuation from where we ended with the following subtopics. Establishment of national military and legal institutions and problems hindering development in Africa after independence. In the previous lesson, we started the, the topic with the changes in political, ideological, and administrative systems, changes in economic development policies and strategies, provision of social services after independence. And today, we shall start the last part of this topic so that we finalize the topic and see what will come next in future. And we shall deal with the two subtopics written on the board, establishment of national military and legal institutions, problems hindering development in Africa after independence. We shall not waste our time. Uh, let us now see the objectives of having this lesson today, that at the end of the lesson, we, uh, it is my expectation that we would have acquired a certain level of competence in, in having the knowledge in the topic, and that is analyzing the objectives of establishing national military and legal institutions, and national legal institutions, assessing the function, strength, and weaknesses of national military and, and national legal institutions, and analyzing the social, political, and economic problems hindering development in Africa after independence. And lastly, we shall look at uh, the steps taken to solve problems hindering development in Africa after independence. Then to test ourselves or gauge how much we would have grasped, would have acquired from the presentation, we shall go through a question that I expect that at the end of the lesson we will be able to answer. Um, with the competence, and that is proper solutions are needed for solving the economic problems hindering development in Africa. Substantiate this statement by giving six points. So we can we are going through that. So if you are going to listen to me carefully, we shall be in position to give the correct answers for that question. Now we begin uh, straight uh, away with the establishment of national military and legal institutions in Africa after independence. The military institutions is the establishment of the state that oversees the armed forces. We know of the military, it is, uh, the military is everywhere in the world, even in our country. And um, the task of the military is usually defined as defense of the state and its citizen. Uh, in broader terms, the military include the army, the police, and prison forces. There are, uh, are forces for defense, forces for maintenance of law and order, and forces to ensure stability of a country by protecting uh, the country from all the possible attacks, all possible physical attacks. Uh, the After independence, African governments had a massive task of building military forces of their own. The ones they inherited from at independence from the colonial master with the colonial type with the mentality of suppression and subjugation not to provide service to the citizens, but the colonial interests. The colonial master left the military institutions or the military bodies of his own, but the intention was never to help the African people, neither were they for the protection of the interests of the the African people, the African states that acquired independence. The militaries were built by the colonial master for his own reason to help him in the exploitation of the resources in the colonies, and thus they were organs of suppression and exploitation. The new governments that est were established after independence had a different view. They had to create the militaries of their own that were uh, nationalist in minded, patriotic in perspective, and ready to serve the interests of their nations and their and their people, not like the colonial masters, the militaries that were uh, served the colonial masters. So majority of African recruits in the colonial army were unlearned men who were equipped with a few skills to suppress fellow Africans. 
they were taken men were taken who could fight fellow Africans given a few skills and and equipped with weapons to suppress and fight fellow Africans to help the colonial master exploit the colonies as much as he wanted. They were not nationalistic or patriotic fronts for the defense or for the well-being of their citizens. Uh, they, they, it included mercenaries and, and permanent militaries like the Kara that was established by the British in their uh, East African colonies. We know, we remember that in the establishment of colonialism, the colonial masters hired mercenaries. A mercenary is a, a, someone who fights for another country and not his own. These mercenaries were brought in in the colonies to help the colonial master establish himself and help him in the exploitation of the colonies through suppression of the indigenous people. We have a few examples with the Germans bringing in into the German East African colonies. They brought in the Somalis, the Nubians, the Zulu, and the Manyema in to help them suppress resistances and establish their rule. The British also hired the, the Sudanese soldiers in the establishment of their rule in Uganda. These mercenaries later were incorporated into the permanent armies that were established like the King's African Rifle, rifles that were established by the British in their East African colonies from 1902 and lasting to 1961 when independence was attained by Tanganyika. Let us look at the, the National Army. The Army is a permanent organization of the military land forces of a nation or state. It is that you see, we know the Army even in, in the country, there are armies and this, uh, it is just nothing but it is the one we call the military or uh, the, the military land forces of a nation or a state. The army primary duty is to defend the state and its citizen against external attack. So that is the major reason why the army is there, to defend the country, its citizen against external attack. And if need be, wage war against those countries, the aggressor countries against the, uh, the, the country of their own. So the, the army in that way can also be used to wage war uh, for the interests of the state. It might be the interest of protecting the, the, the citizens of the state or to fight an aggressor country. It typically consists of an army, the navy, air force and other military units that according to the country concerned. After independence, African states had the task of building nationalistic and patriotic forces that will protect the, their nation's interests, uh, national security and integrity and serve the, the people. We know, we have already seen that the colonial militaries like the KR in East Africa were transformed into national forces at independence because African countries had no armies of their own. They had to rely on those armies that were left by the colonial masters. What their task then was to transform them into military or uh, nationalistic forces or patriotic forces for the uh, service of their nation and the people. In, in areas where liberation was attained by armed struggle in such colonies like uh, Angola, Mozambique, uh, Namibia, uh, Namibia, Algeria, Kenya, those very national forces, were tra the, the liberation forces of the African people were transformed into national armies. These, it was quite simpler for these countries to develop nationalistic patriotic forces because these armies that fought the colonial masters already had that nationalistic uh, spirit in them and they knew that their, their work was to protect their nations and the people against the invaders including the colonial masters. We go very fast looking at the functions of the national army. Defense functions. The task of the military is usually defined as defense of the state and each citizen against the external attack. That one I already explained very well. In case of an attack, the army will, will repel the aggressors or the invaders. We have a good example that in the Kagera War of in the Kagera War of nineteen the Kagera War of nineteen seventy uh, eight seventy nine uh, the invasion of Tanzania by by Idi Amin was repulsed by the National Army of Tanzania and Idi Amin saw it hot and he was forced to leave to run away for his safety to exile. Then uh, conduct war, the army might be used to, for aggressive purposes, that is to wage war against another state. I've already said that the state might be an aggressor state or to wage war for nationalistic interests like protection of the people uh, if they, that state is endangering the life of the, the citizens of that uh, country. 
provide services during emergencies. During emergencies, the armies, mili the military might be uh, deployed to help the people, to help evacuating the people in from dangerous areas. For example, during earthquakes or uh, floods. We have an example in the country. From 1997 to 2000, there were uh, dangerous El Nino rains in the lake zone, and the army was used so much, was relied upon by the government to uh, to evacuate people from areas of danger. Uh, also, since 2013, there have been excessive rains in the Islam region and areas affected with floods. We see uh, it's a, a practice that we see the military coming in to help their citizens into uh, evacuating them from the dangerous areas. That is what we call, we say, to provide service to the citizen or to, to serve the interests of the nation and its people. Unlike the colonial army, it could not do this. Its work was to suppress fellow Africans and help in the exploitation of resources. Then another one, it participates in the national building activities. They can provide, the army can provide social and economic services. They run hospitals and schools and people, or they admit all or citizens into uh, their uh, social services for, to attain services that can help in the building the nation. But also, uh, it can be you since the army has got profession can provide skilled labor or in the provision of uh, construction of infrastructures like roads, schools, and bridges. We have a good example that recently a, bro a, a, a road was broken uh, connecting uh, the main road from Dar es Salaam to Mwanza and the army was deployed to build a bridge by the government. It advises the state on defense matters. The, the government have to rely on the army to for advisors on defense matters to help in building the nation or else to provide uh, a practical uh, advisors that will help the state in the state matters and or how to construct a better military. See, and also since the army has got professions, they can advise the government on political, social, economic issues to see if a way forward to solve the problems uh, affecting or uh, uh, faced by the country. It carries out recruitment and training of new recruits. That is, they provide training courses for recruits and uh, national service. When, when the new recruits are needed by the government into the military, then the army provides uh, training, the necessary training to equip them with the necessary skills to enable them to serve their nation and their people. Then uh, we go to the national uh, police forces. The police force is a body of trained officers entrusted by the government with maintenance of public peace and order, enforcement of laws and prevention and detection of crime. The definition itself can help us see the functions of the national police, mainly to uh, public for public peace and order. That one moves along with the enforcement of laws there we see the police handling criminals or detecting criminals or arresting those criminals or culprits that who intend or would have been uh, found breaking the law and ensure the safety of the people and their uh, properties. African governments had the duty to establish independent police forces after their independence from the colonial, uh, uh, colonial rule. In history, we have that the colonial police and colonial army were almost the same thing, having the same functions and serving the same master with the same intention of suppressing Africans to see that they are compelled to, rule, to be ruled by the foreigners and their resources exploited. African governments had a duty to establish independent police forces after the independence from, their, from the colonial rule. We know that the colonial masters, military forces, including the police, were not nationalistic in character neither were they patriotic to serve the interests of their people. They were an armed force, an armed hand of the colonial master to suppress and uh, subjugate the Africans so, as, so that they can easily be exploited. Then also, we should remember that the colonial master did not have a definite police force. In most cases, the police and the army were the, the same thing. At independence, these African governments had to create different uh, military institutions to separate them, from each other, that they are independent from each other and serve the, their nation accordingly. After independence, specialized forces were created by African governments. Police officers received training from within the country and others were, were taken abroad for further training so that they acquire the needed skills to have to, to, to 
to professionalize the, the armed forces, the police force, to be equipped with the modern skills to serve their people and the, in their interests of the independent African countries. The European officers uh, were had to be replaced by the African officers who received training and qualified to be to, to lead others in, in the, these military forces. The police force has specialized sections or departments that include uh, regular police, national security, intelligence service, criminal investigation department, traffic police, administration police, police air wing, general service unit, anti narcotics department, flying squad, anti stock and prosecution units. These are some and maybe there could be others that are forgotten to mention and we can go straight forward to look at the functions of national police forces. One already said to keep law and order, the main duty, this is the main duty of the police forces uh, is, uh, and that is uh, the lawbreakers arrested by the police. The police they, we already seen detects and arrest lawbreakers so as to maintain that there is law and order, law enforcement is put into place in the countries. And this, you see the police always, it is the most functional military institution into, uh, into the public. It is the more functional uh, because it is more close to the people and we see them, their activities always involve the citizens. So uh, they are always there to detect and arrest lawbreakers and put for them for custody or to laws of courts and maybe found guilty, convicted by the laws of courts. Protection services. The police forces protect people and their uh, property against danger. That is, we know, usalama waraia na malizake. Then they, they carry out patrols for this purpose. You see the police sometimes at night or during, uh, during uh, skirmishes or sort of disorder. They patrol around to see that people are safe, that they are protected, people and their properties. In this way, uh, when they found the guilty or when they found the culprits, the criminals, they have to be arrested to ensure that people are protected. To carry out defensive, de detective and investigation duties. The police fo forces detect and investigate against crimes. This, that's why we have the criminal investigation de department in the police. By this, it collects information and evidences on crimes and, uh, and suspects and criminals are arrested. The police carry out investigation on crimes, they carry out investigation and if uh, done with their work, the, those found guilty or the criminals are arrested and forwarded for other uh, procedures. The police uh, traffic station keep road safety. We know that we see the, the traffic officers along roads every day. Their work is to maintain that there's road safety and proper uh, respect of road and regulations of traffic rules, we can say. They carry out investigation. They also investigate on drivers. They investigate on other road users to see that traffic rules on roads are observed. And we see them uh, that that is their daily uh, activities. Traffic officers are everywhere. You can even seek more information from them. They, 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 because they serve the, the citizens, they'll provide more information. The police arrest and open charges against criminals. You have seen that in their patrols, when they, or when, when in a case, if it is reported to them, they arrest the, the culprits and then charge them. Uh, then they are forwarded to other, uh, to the legal institutions for, for reprimandation. Provide service during emergencies, like the, the army, the police can help in evacuating people, evacuating people from dangerous areas, like in floods areas or areas affected by earthquakes or volcanoes or landslides and other forms, even drought areas other f and other forms of uh, uh, dangers. The police does this to serve, the, to provide service to humanity or to the citizens. Participates in national building activities. They can participate in construction of hospitals, schools and roads and they can provide other necessary services to the government where need be. They can provide other professional services because the police also has professions like doctors, uh, lawyers, and others. Gives advice on law and security matters. The police gives advice to the state, other armed forces, and the public on important law and, and security uh, matters. So we can, the police can provide these services. We see police officers in, in, in most cases come in to 
to come in to explain different duties of theirs and try to build public awareness by giving the necessary information about security and other social economic issues that they see it is their responsibility to give to the public. They, we see police officers, traffic officers over the media addressing people on, in seminars and other educative uh, platforms that to see for that they bring down the necessary uh, knowledge and skills to the people that are required to see that the country's law and order are observed and security uh, ensured. Also to provide uh, security skills and knowledge to the people. Another uh, military arm is the national prison forces. Prison system, independent African states have today are traced from the colonial system. At first, the prisons were operated by the colonial police before it was separated to be an independent police force. Colonial prisons served one duty that was to, to put in custody the colonized subjects who broke the colonial uh, laws. The same with, the, with the, the prisons today that they in keeping custody those lawbreakers as those who have been uh, passed on to them by the, coast, by, by the courts of law. In Tanganyika, for example, the prison unit was separated by the British colonial force in, from, in 1931 to operate as an independent unit. It was inherited by Tanganyika after independence. When the British took over, the German police that was known as the Turkish police was incorporated into the British administration. Uh, the, the British, what, what the British achieved in, in, in building their police force was to separate it from the colonial military the way the Germans had uh, left it. After independence, the Tanganyikan government had to inherit the same military force or the prisons. Then the task was to transform it into a national-minded or nationalistic character to serve the people. The functions of the prison forces. To handle prisoners in custody, one of the functions of the, 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 the prisons, they serve as correction centers. So they handle those who have been or who are on trial or those who have been sentenced for punishment, uh, for imprisonment or who are supposed to be jailed. So they handle prisoners in custody and see their safety and see, ensure that they serve the punishment that have been assigned to them by the courts of law punish lawbreakers by detaining them for the recommended time by the courts of law. So they handle, they punish, different punishment can, as assigned by the courts of law include corporal punishment and others, ma manual labor. We see prisoners around, sometimes they are being taken to different areas for uh, to handle uh, manual or vigorous uh, work. Correct the behavior of the prisoners therefore works to transform them into law-abiding and good citizens. Already seen that uh, the one of the functions of the, uh, the prison forces is that to keep custody of the prisoners and there their punishments are administered to them to transform them into better citizens. That's why it is said that the prisons are correction centers. The fourth is help prisoners acquire productive skills such as farming and carpentry. Prison the prisons have got workshops to train prisoners on different activities including carpentry, mechanics, uh, farming and other important activities that might help them in future when their terms of imprisonment expire. Participate in the national building activities. Prison run farms, workshops, uh, for example the carpentry whose, uh, whose products are sold to the public. They also run schools and other services that help that held in building the nation. Like the police, like the military, they also have some socioeconomic activities that they run on their own to help in the facilitation of different activities, but also to raise income on their own and help uh, others uh, get uh, into involved into the production productive activities. The other uh, part of the armed forces of the government is the uh, migration department. The department deals with the persons and goods uh, coming into or leaving the country. That is what we call the, the, the major role or the, 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 the intention of the migration department. Its functions uh, include, uh, it handles issues of migrations, checking passports and issuing visas to immigrants, issuing passport to citizens in need of traveling abroad, collects revenue from passports, fee and custom duties, 
arrest and arrange for the repatriation of illegal immigrants. Those ones, when they are arrested, they are uh, taken back to their home countries. Then we have the National Service as another um, uh, part of the national military is the, uh, the, uh, the National Service. The National Service handles training of youth who graduate from A-level secondary education and colleges who are required to join the National Service for a stipulated period of time. This one, uh, the major reference to us here in Tanzania, in, in Africa is in Tanzania, that the National Service was introduced in the 1960s, that is 1963, and lasted until uh, some time. It was embarked on by the, by the government to see that uh, youth are trained on s certain important activities that we shall see the objectives of the service. To prepare, uh, the objectives of the service include to prepare youth for national defense. Uh, they are provided with necessary skills for national defense and in times of need, they can be called upon to assist the, the army or other armed forces in ensuring defense or other purposes that entails peace and security. They provide useful knowledge and skills in different economic activities such as farming. When their youth are taken from national service are given, they are trained to perform different skills or productive skills including farming, including other skills that the military or that their tutors or the trainers might, might see necessary for them. Shape the ideology of the state. Uh, when they are there, they are impacted with national nationalistic ideology for patriotic preparation that uh, these are youth who should serve their nation and have that spirit and zeal to see that they protect the interests of the state. A nationalist ideology may, is imparted in them. For example, if a country is socialist, then a socialist ideology is imparted on them and such ideas uh, should spread to others. Build nationality by encouraging cooperation and solidarity on national and legal issues. Then uh, we move very fast after seeing the military uh, organs of the military institution and well now we go to the second part of this first subtopic and that is the national legal institutions. Uh, dear students and all those who are interested in watching or li listening to this session with me, then let us now start with the, uh, we, we start analyzing on the national legal institutions. The legal institutions operate under the judiciary one of the arms of the government, the institutions include courts of law managed by of officials such as magistrates, judges, and other officials working under the courts, including clerks, prosecutors, and other, other important secretaries and other important uh, 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 professions that might be part of these courts of law or the judiciary. The prisons also operate under the directive of the courts of law after the independence, legal institutions were established by African states to substitute the colonial court system that indeed were not for the service of the people but to help the colonial master implement his policies that aimed at exploiting and subjugating African people. Uh, they aimed at making the inferiority attitude among the African people and erode their culture into the Europeans so that the Africans be submissive to serve the colonial master. The new systems that were created by independent African governments were then intended to see that the interest or the achievement of independence or the benefits of independence are, are, are reached to all citizens of the country. The judiciary is one of the principal organs of the government have said alongside the executive and the parliament. The duty of the judiciary then is to interpret and apply laws to specific cases. The, the, while as the duty of the the duty of the parliament is to make laws, then the judiciary interprets and see that they apply laws to specific cases in the in the country. In broad terms, the judiciary is concerned with administration of justice through courts of law. The judiciary is headed by the chief justice. The functions of the legal institutions. Uh, maybe you can say the judiciary, interprets the laws made by the legislative assembly to help avoid misunderstanding and contradictions uh, in the implementation of the laws. So the judiciary, when the parliament or the national assemblies makes laws, then the laws are passed into the judiciary to see a harmonious um, path that they do not contradict uh, or they do not create misunderstandings between other laws and other procedures or policies of the, of the country. 
apply laws to, speci to specific cases. In case of law breaking, the courts will apply the laws to reprimand the law breakers. When a law is broken, the culprit will be, the laws will be interpreted by the, the courts of law to see which punishment that person is, which punishment is due to that person. Law enforcement, in case of law breaking, so the, the judiciary help in, in, the, in the management of that by punishing lawbreakers, by assigning punishment in accordance to the law. Punishment vary according to the crimes committed, so the, it is the judiciary to see what, what punishment should be administered to a certain case uh, or to a certain convict court of a certain case. Settle legal disputes between the individuals and, or between the people and the state or the government. So when you people have cases, maybe um, marriage issues, the case can be forwarded to the, the case can be forwarded to the courts of law to the police maybe the police can forward it to the courts of law then the laws administer um, or settle those disputes between the people or between the people or a group of people and their government people can sue the government see the work of the judiciary now to intervene and see how justice can be employed and the rights of the people are respected protection of the constitution when laws are made by the legislature the judiciary have the duty to make sure that the laws do not contradict with the constitution before it is enacted. We already see the interpretation, but now here the judiciary comes in to see that all systems of the government, the judiciary and the parliament coordinate well to see that the laws may serve for the interest and do not contradict with other state procedures. They handle inheritance issues, the courts help in handling the will of the people, and when people maybe they can make will on the how their property should be managed after when they when they pass on or when they die so they pass over the wills to the judiciary then after their demise after their death it is the judiciary to handle to interpret the wills or to help in the management or administering of the implementation of what was anticipated in the will then another one the judiciary advises the executive and, le and legislature on constitutional and legal matters. These two organs of the state will always refer to the ju judiciary in matters of legal or law issues. So always the judiciary will provide assistance to see that all the system work uh, harmoniously with no uh, uh, contradictions. The strength, it ensures the, the rule of the law helps in respect of national constitution and thus helps in the development of democratic governance. When there is a rule of law, then democracy is ensured. It is the judiciary to stand on it that the rules are followed and uh, people's rights are protected. Contributes the protection of human rights through administering of justice. If the, the judiciary is impartial, then justice can be uh, maintained. If, it, if the judiciary abide by the strict laws set by the government or the laws abide by the constitution, then justice can be uh, uh, employed and rights of people be uh, protected. Advise the government on legal matters. The government, I've already said, will only refer to the judiciary in terms of in matters concerning uh, the laws. Protect the aggrieved uh, person if someone is wronged or uh, someone has taken a case to the courts of law uh, seeking for ass assistance or protection for people, those who have wronged him, then it is the judiciary to handle such and settle the, 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 the issues. Fight crime by convicting the lawbreakers. Now, dear students, uh, those who are, all of, who are watching me now, we, ha we are through with the, the national military and legal institutions. We can now turn to the, the other, the remaining subtopic of the lesson today, and that is the problems hindering development in Africa. And then if we have time, we shall look at the solutions, that ca the steps that have been taken by African government to see that the problems are solved. The problems are, the problems, the problems hindering social uh, economic development can be categorized as political, social, and economic. African countries are still lagging far behind compared to the developed countries and this is attributed to a number of problems, circumstantial problems or problems underlying the 
the, what is going on in Africa and to see that Africa is not at the level of those developed countries of uh, the Western world, that is Western Europe, United States of America and Canada and others like Australia and th those such uh, devol ca developed countries. They are underlying problems that are really uh, keeping Africa behind and we can just go through them briefly. We cannot go through all of them but we shall try to go through as many as we can and maybe begin with the political political problems. The problems include from the onset of at independence was one party rule. We have political instabilities We have also this neo-colonialism, this issue of incompetent, leaders. There's one and most notorious also we have, and that is corruption. One of the major ulcers the development of Africa. We saw already well, in the previous uh, lesson that one of the problems affecting African development is well, the one party role. They were, these parties were, were really dictatorial system of governments. They were conservative. They, they limited people's freedom in participation in social, economic, political affairs. So they limited people's, uh, they limited competition and people's ability to perform. The parties we have said were conservative, the rulers wanted to stay long on power and we are not always ready to accept new ideas. Their inacceptance of new ideas kept uh, African countries behind. More so, their autocratic rule meant that people lacked freedom or to do what they want and this one affected development because it was they were slow in accepting ideas that can could help development. Parties were so much autocratic and centralized that it was difficult to allow in challenges or criticism against the rule. And in this way, the, there was slow acceptance or slow change into new and acceptable practical ideas. Then we uh, that throughout from the 1960s to the late 1980s, it was difficult for Africa to realize development and by, 1980, by the late 1980s when multi-party system was reinstated in, in Africa, African countries were in really bad political economic shape. Africa, the poverty in Africa, the laws, development of economic sector was really intolerable to the extent that it was difficult to manage uh, economic and social development, economic, social, political development in African countries. Then another, we have the second problem as political instabilities. These are of several types. There are civil wars. Coup d'etats. We have uh, secessionists. Attempts. All these affected and others like post-election violences affect the development in Africa. Countries of Africa since independence have been ridden by several civil wars. There are these civil wars, uh, coup d'etats, border conflicts, secessionist movements. Have ravaged the economic development of many African countries. We, we might not li have enough time to mention all of them, but like in the West African region where countries like uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, uh, Ivory Coast, Mali uh, have been ridden by these political instabilities. Countries like Ghana, Nigeria have experienced a number of coups and there is a problem that there's lack, th there was lack of stability in these countries. Also on the other side that in case of a war, a civil war, a border conflict, a coup d'etat, 
stress economic stagnation as countries have to spend a lot of their scarce resources on trying to, to restore peace and create stability other than in economic development. They have to go purchase weapons, they have to go for peace talks and all the likes and these ones really retards the development. The income that would have been used, the resources that would have been used for economic development are then turned into just creating peace, creating peace. Another uh, issue is neo-colonialism, you have already written. Neo-colonial powers, the developed, the developed powers, or the, especially the Western powers, interfere into the affairs of, of African countries. They impose policies on them, that imp the policies that they impose are for the benefit of those imperialist powers, they inc including maybe to allow free foreign investment, exploitation of natural resources, which leave little African countries into uh, slowed economic development. Also impose sanctions on African countries that refuse to comply with their demands. We have countries like, um, like Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe was, has faced so many sanctions. We have countries like Libya. These faced sanctions by the Western powers because these the leaders of these countries had refused to be their puppets and serve their interests. The imperial power also uh, interfere into the political uh, fields of African countries. Sometimes they come in even to overthrow regimes that are not in their favor. For example, the USA and USA and other like Britain, France uh, intervene into Libya to overthrow the Libyan, the Libyan leader. The Libyan leader. Uh, Muammar al-Gaddafi, who was overthrown and assassinated in a civil war that was sponsored and by those imperialist or developed nations. This has really undermined the development and welfare of these of African countries, that now they have to dance on the tune set by, the, by those imperialist powers, other than setting pace, their own pace and policies for the, co the, the, the benefit of their, um, uh, their countries. Then another problem is the incompetent leaders. Some African leaders are really not fit to, for leadership. They lack the political will, they lack practical measures to see that they are able to utilize fully the resources in their countries, they develop their countries. So many leaders, we cannot have time, we, ca we don't have enough of time, the time to mention all of them. And these leaders, at the end of the day, they end up being puppets of the imperialist masters who serve the, the, the foreign powers and their interests rather than serving their people. Then there is another is corruption. Corruption. We already say that this one is one of the major ulcers. to the development of Africa. It is always done by selfish politicians or people who hold office, who embezzle public funds for their own purposes, for their own selfish interests. Most of these, especially politicians, end up banking uh, their, the money they steal from their countries in overseas banks and end up de benefiting those uh, countries there. In the end, the money, the, the resources that would have been used in the development of their own countries, helping the provision of social services and improvement in the welfare of the people, ends up in the pockets of few who do this for malicious intentions for the benefit of their own and their families. It is an ulcer that is eating a lot of African countries. You young people listening to me there, please don't participate and, disc and please discourage corruption. Don't participate in any corrupt um, uh, attempts or activities. For example, don't give bribe, neither should you receive bribes and stop others from doing the same or even report them to the, uh, to the authorities uh, where possible. Now we can turn to the, the social problems. There are problems like disease, natural calamities,
religious conflicts tribalism have illiteracy and ignorance Now there we are. As I explained very fast, disease. Africa is ridden with a number of diseases. The most common diseases, um, the common disease in Africa is malaria. We have AIDS, HIV AIDS. Then we have others like ep epidemics like cholera, like um, Ebola. Now we have also uh, the COVID-19, the coronavirus disease uh, 19. These have put African countries in huge losses of their natural resources since governments and families have to spend a lot of their scarce resources in fighting diseases other than uh, spending them on the devo other developmental issues. Uh, also, uh, the disease claim like AIDS claim a lot of youth or would, would, would have provided useful labor into the development of their countries. And disease are also time wasting yeah, that sometimes people have to spend days or months or even years uh, reading on uh, reading on their bed, uh, sick beds and not go performing any economic activities. So there is need to fight disease and uh, we can help each other. Maybe the government and the public should be sensitized on how to fight disease and help see a way forward. Then another uh, problem is natural calamities. We have cases, so many uh, forms of natural calamities that have affected African countries. Mainly a drought. Then we have earthquakes. We have earthquakes. and others like floods and diseases. We have uh, many others, landslide, volcano eruptions. Uh, some countries are always in danger of drought. They are drought ridden countries. And these include Ethiopia, Somalia, Chad, the Central African Republic, Niger. They suffer prolonged droughts leading to failure of crop uh, cultivation and death of a lot of their livestock. In the end, they end up lacking uh, food and other essential needs for their uh, upkeep. There are also earthquakes which have uh, got African countries in trouble. You remember in Tanzania in 2016, the earthquake that hit the Kagera, the Kagera region, leaving a lot of, I don't want to talk a lot about this because fellow countrymen were lost there in this but maybe I'll, I'll address it on the economic point of view that governments have to using a lot of its income in trying to put back things to order by reconstruction of the destroyed infrastructures like homesteads like um, schools roads to see that situation comes back to normal and help those people who have been affected by the concerned the concerned uh, by the concerned natural calamity. Another problem is uh, religious conflicts. There are countries who are really in problems of this, whereby different religions cannot accommodate each other. We have a number of examples. Some of these have been due to those religious and the fundamentalist religious movements like Al Shabab, Al Shabab the anti-Balaka uh, movement, the Christian movement that was formed in Central African Republic to fight the Muslims, the Al-Shabaab that hit whoever, including uh, non-Muslims and Muslims. We have Boko Haram in Nigeria as the religious fundamentalist groups that are really causing a lot of trouble in Africa. They attack people, they attack infrastructures and leading to a lot of destruction and social economic unrest. But more so, there are so many religious um, conflicts among the people that this one has really affected unity. We have countries like Nigeria, where the northerners, most of the northerners, are dominated by 
the, the Fulani and the Hausa, Muslim against the Southerners, majority of whom the Igbo and the Yoruba, most of them are Muslim. This, it, is, it was hard to get this country into United just because of religious conflicts. So I would like to give just a simple advice on how we can solve this religious issue is through applying uh, the following love for all love for all hatred for for none if we can have this we shall avoid those uh, religious tribal differences among our in our societies and live in harmonious and solve problems together and work together in all necessary uh, things. Also we have to understand that religion should accommodate each other for a peaceful coexistence and we can live in harmony and love by just accepting each other the way, uh, by just accepting our diversity also as a strong force for our uh, union. Then another uh, problem is about we can just mention it briefly because the due to short of time is among them what we said was illiteracy. That with illiteracy, uh, it has denied people chance to know the, re the available responsibility before them and it has limited them to see that they have proper utilization of the resources about them or also to know the opportunities that can be availed to them or uh, by their societies. We have economic problems. Go very fast, I said. Uh, economic problems include we have regionalism, we have regionalism, we have law, science, and technology. We have monoculture, these are some of the um, economic problems, regionalism whereby there is unequal distribution of national uh, resources whereby some leaders have propelled, have, are still continuing with the colonial system of divide and rule, they promote only harmony and development in their own regions, leaving other regions behind. This one has great problems and constant immigration from people from the low developed areas to those that are somehow developed. Low science and technology is a major problem that has kept most of the sectors of production behind and African countries use a lot of their resources to import uh, ex expensive technology from the developed countries. Then monoculture economy, that most African countries are agricultural economies uh, with their other sectors like industry, mining, fishing still lagging far behind. This has put African countries on a decent advantage in the international trade that most of the time their agricultural uh, products suffer economic uh, or low price, uh, uh, the, the, the low prices or price fluctuation in the world market and leading to low low uh, accusation of foreign uh, exchange. Then there's low uh, infrastru infrastructure development in African countries and most of African regions are remote and isolated from each other with the low sectors of production simply due to low economic or poor infrastructure. Uh, the steps that African governments have taken after independence, steps taken to solve the problems. I'll go very fast in analyzing them. One of them is the formation of the Organization of African Unity that was formed immediately a few days after independence of some African countries to unite African countries and see forward how they can work jointly together to see that they develop their countries and fight their enemies, that is uh, colonialism and neocolonialism that sabotage development in, in two Africa. Then another information of regional economic uh, cooperations that will help integrate African countries into unions 
to develop self-sustaining economies and see how they can properly utilize their resources. The another one you can see the adoption of socialism. African countries, uh, some African countries like Tanzania, Zambia, uh, Senegal adopted the socialist approach for proper utilization of their resources, also as a means to avoid Western uh, influence into their political economic affairs and see a way forward to Africanize the system so that they create development that fit African, African, African countries for the benefit of the people by eliminating classes and avoid capitalist exploitation. The another one is training more skilled labor, which most of the government, African governments have done by uh, encouraging education, building more learning institutions to see that enrollment is increased to increase more uh, labor into African countries and uh, stop relying on the foreign experts for serving their economic fields. Another one is the exploitation of natural resources. There are mining activities, the exploitation of land resources in different countries. In Tanzania, in Zambia, Angola, there are strong mining uh, countries where mining sector is really developing very fast. And also, uh, proper land utilization. Tans the, the government of Tanzania, for example, introduced uh, Kilimo Kwanza. Kilimo Kwanza programs that was the means to, to develop agriculture in the country since the agriculture is the main economic activity in the country. Then another one is fight corruption. We have seen many countries making institutions to fight corruption. In Tanzania we have PCCB or Takukuru to fight corruption. Many cases have been detected and, and the culprits have been handled. Some have been even forced to return the money that is sold from the government. We see the government now doing a lot of this. All corrupt officials are, are handled restrictively by the government to see that uh, corruption is stopped and the rule of law is uh, promoted. Another one is increase in the infrastructure construction, which many African governments are doing with um, uh, a lot of efforts. We are seeing all over the country, the government here and there, constructing roads, bridges, providing all necessary transport facilities to open the country for development and also help in the development of economic uh, sectors, agriculture, industry, mining, and others like, um, like tourism and the, the like. So there are a lot of things which the government, uh, the government, African governments are doing and really helping in the opening up the country for development. Uh, I would not like to waste a lot of your time. Now we summarize the lesson today by looking at the, the reflective question that we have as a guide and as a, a parameter to see how much we have grasped in the, in the lesson. It reads, suggests six possible solutions to the economic problems hindering development in Africa. And the answer can be seen through proper utilization of resources, through training more skilled labor, investment in new technology other than only importing the te technology from the developed countries, uh, training more labor, have um, uh, domestic labor and not only relying on uh, expatriates which are expensive, economic diversification, construction of more infrastructure to open up countries for development, to open the rural areas for production, to open, uh, to connect in, uh, producers and manufacturers, to connect towns and, and cities to the rural areas where all materials are, are, are collected to the towns where industries are. Then um, another one can is strengthen regional and economic and continental cooperation to see that African can integrate and have interdependent economies rather than depending on the assistance from the developed countries. Another one is proper planning. This one includes proper budgeting and proper allocation of physical and human resources. This one can be done if everything is put on plan, then development can be achieved. Encouraging mass participation and patriotism, this can help a lot of things that people can participate wholeheartedly in the development of their country and rely on their government and support their government in the political economic developments that are, 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 are given by the government to see that the country move forward. Lastly is end corruption. Uh, this one also is a spirit that can be instilled in people to fight for their countries by ending corruption as a means to provide uh, justice. That is the end of our discussion and presentation today. My presentation to you has come to an end in that way. And I appreciate that you have been there listening to me. I pray and wish you well in all the matters with that you are doing. I wish you well that you can have enough knowledge, you can make research to acquire more, and hope you have benefited a lot from what I have delivered to you and enjoyed it. 
God willingly, you, it can be useful knowledge to you if you put it into constructive thinking and have a positive mind towards what I've said. Thank you very much for listening to me and God bless you. Thank you.